Okay, so we are now um, just about to start. Uh, there may be some people who are logging on at the very end of the hour, but um, uh, thank you all for, for attending. Um, I'll just give it a little bit more time. Uh, hopefully you'll, you're able to see me, uh, David Stutzman, and um, Sharon Klein, and uh, Gerald Cohen, and Thomas Abendroff, and Mark Rosler. I will introduce everybody in just a minute, but let us give about one more minute and then we will, um, we will uh, go forward. Um, and I'll also give you the, the um, how, how the, um, the webinar is going to proceed. Um, I will remind everybody that there are uh, questions uh, that you can ask, um, but they will be um, asked by me on your behalf uh, at the end of the presentation by the, by the lecturers. Uh, so as we are pretty much at the top of the hour, uh, I will start. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, my name is David Stutzman. I'm counsel to Seward and Kissel, and I'm chair of the Estate and Gift Taxation Committee at the New York City Bar Association. On behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome you to the 2021 Mortimer H. Hess Memorial Lecture. Mortimer Hess, who received three degrees from Columbia University, including law, was a pioneer scholar in the field of federal tax law and a recognized expert in trust and estates law. His career began in New York just two years before the enactment of the federal income tax in 1913, and he continued to practice law until his death in 1968. He was an active member of the association during his career, and he was remembered by the association at his death for possessing an incisive mind that combined in rare balance a broad knowledge of taxes, trusts, estates, and wills, which enabled him to develop a broad gauged approach to estate planning. He combined a lively imagination with his legal scholarship and was not fearful of breaking paths and techniques in this field, which is a great lesson to us all. Following his death, Mr. Hess's family and former colleagues provided generous funding to the association in his memory uh, for the establishment of this lecture series, which has been sponsored annually by the Committee on Estate and Gift Taxation by the City Bar since the late 1960s. The subjects of the lectures generally are related to laws that relates to taxation, trusts, and estates, and past speakers have included professors, authors, reporters, and noted practitioners and authorities recognized in their field. This evening, it is my great pleasure, on behalf of the Estate and Gift Taxation Committee, to welcome a number of noted experts to speak with us on a couple of fascinating developments that bridge estate planning and estate taxation with a compelling title. It's a thriller, lessons learned from the estate of Michael Jackson and the potential impact of New York's new postmortem right of publicity. Now, as some of you may know, the postmortem right of publicity is an heir's right to control and profit from the commercial use of a deceased person's name, likeness, or image. You might think that it's somewhat the opposite of the right of privacy. After Michael Jackson, the noted singer and entertainer, died in, 19, in 2009, his name and image were critical components of his estate to be valued on his estate tax return. But given the scandals that swirled around, his, around him at the time of his death and resulting harm to his reputation, the estate valued those rights at only $2,000. On audit, the IRS responded with a value of $435 million. 12 years later, in a decision widely hailed as stupendous success for the estate, the tax court issued a, a decision valuing Jackson's postmortem right of publicity at just over $4 million. While some states like California have recognized postmortem publicity rights for decades, New York's rights are relatively recent. In fact, New York just enacted its postmortem right of publicity statute on May 29 of 2021. For this year's Mortimer H. Hess lecture, a distinguished panel of four experts will review the history of the case of Michael Jackson, the commissioner, and how its lessons may better inform front-end estate planning. We'll also explore the provisions of the new New York statute and compare its coverage to that provided by other states across the country. Our moderator for this evening uh, and one of our speakers is Sharon Klein. Sharon may be familiar to some of the attendees of this lecture series, she actually delivered the Mortimer H. Hess Memorial Lecture in 2018. She's president of the Family Wealth Eastern U.S. Region of Wilmington Trust and based out of New York City. She's responsible for overseeing the delivery of all wealth management services by teams of professionals, advisors, and regularly mentioned as a top advisor, both locally and nationally. She was cited by Cranes as one of the most notable women in financial advice. 
She's a fellow of the American College of Trust and Estates Council, or ACTEC, and later this year will be inducted into the Estate Planning Hall of Fame. In addition to moderating the panel, Sharon will provide critical background on the enactment of the New York statute. Gerald Cohen, the partner and co-chair of the Trust and Estates Litigation um, Department at Freeman, Freeman and Smiley in Century City, California, focuses on complex trust and estates administration and estate planning, as well as dispute resolution. She has particular expertise in issues arising from careers in the music and film industries, including the valuation and postmortem administration and distribution of intellectual property rights. She was part of the team that represented the estate of Michael Jackson and will share some lessons learned from that case. Thomas Avendroth of Schiff Harden in Chicago will focus on planning considerations raised by the case and the right of postmortem publicity law. Tom is a partner and, and the practice group leader of the firm's private clients trust and estates group, where he focuses on estate planning, federal taxation and business succession planning. He's a fellow of ACTEC and he's on the board of trustees of his alma mater Northwestern University School of Law. He's also taught since 1990 at the American Bankers Association's National Graduate Trust School. Finally, Gerald's fellow West Coaster, uh, this is a national group that we have here today, uh, is Mark Rosler, founder of the prominent entertainment agency CMG Worldwide in West Hollywood. He's probably represented more famous people than any other agent, according to see it 60 Minutes. During his 40 year career, Mark has worked with over 1700 of the most famous celebrities and or their estates, including the subject of our lecture today, as well as icons such as Elvis Presley, Sophia Loren, Hugh Hefner and Marilyn Monroe, to name but a few. He is recognized around the world for his groundbreaking efforts in establishing rights of deceased celebrities. And he was on the team that represented the estate before the tax court. So we'll hear from him about that issue. Following the presentation by the speakers, they'll be happy to take questions. I presume all of you are familiar with Zoom by now. If you have a question or you would like that you would like me to ask, there's a little box that says Q&A and that you can click that and write the question. I will gather those questions and at the end of the presentations, I will pose them to the, um, to the lecturers uh, time permitting. And without further ado, it is my great pleasure now to turn things over to our 2021 Mortimer H. Hess Memorial Lecturers. So Sharon, it's yours. Thanks so much, David. And good evening, everybody. We are all very excited on the panel, I know, to be talking to you about the postmortem right of publicity, which of course has been very much in the public spotlight lately because of a thriller of a case. Of course, I'm talking about Michael Jackson that was recently decided by Judge Holmes in a 271 page decision, which we will of course summarize for you. Um, so just to explain to you how we thought we'd divide our time today, I'm going to start off by setting the stage, looking at some of the issues we have to grapple with um, when we look at the right of publicity and looking at the state of the states in this regard, because the right of publicity is actually a function of state law. And what we have is a patchwork of laws across the country. And included in the materials that I submitted is a comprehensive state by state guide about half the states in the country have a postmortem right of publicity, either in statutory form or common law form. And in those materials, you'll find a narrative description of each state's laws, as well as a comparative analysis of all the states. So um, I hope that you'll find that a useful reference guide. And of course, in particular, I'm going to take a look at our brand new New York law. Then I'm going to pass it over to Gerald, who, as David said, was one of the attorneys who was on the team representing Michael Jackson's estate. And she's going to talk firsthand about her experience um, in working on that decades long trial um, or the trial that culminated with a decade of work, that's for sure. And then Tom's going to follow with some ideas about planning for the postmortem right of publicity to reduce the potential estate tax hit. And then Mark is going to finish with the methodology that he used to value Michael Jackson's name and image. Yes, he was actually the appraiser who valued Michael Jackson's name and image. And that uh, valuation was largely accepted by the tax court. So we'll hear firsthand from him how he did it. When um, the panelists have all uh, presented their portions, I'm going to come back and I'm going to sum up um, some of the lessons we hope you take away from today's panel and then after we conclude the formal part of the presentation as David said we're going to open it up for questions so please feel free to add your questions into the Q&A. So let's begin with asking what is the right of publicity? 
The right of publicity actually stems from the right of privacy, which as Judge Holmes said in the Michael Jackson case, is really the right to be left alone. But do celebrities want to be left alone? No, celebrities do not want to be left alone. What they do want to do is control their image, who gets to use it, and what basis it, on what basis it is used on. So the right of publicity in a nutshell is an individual's right to control and profit from the commercial use of their name, image, and likeness, and to prevent others exploiting their persona for commercial gain. As I just mentioned, the right of publicity is governed by state law. Some states, most states have statutes. Some states, the right of publicity is rooted in common law. And actually there's a 1977 Supreme Court case, the Zucchini case. And by the way, all cases that I'll refer to are cited in the materials that I submitted. And in that case, the Supreme Court recognized the right of publicity as a separate property right, independent from the right of privacy. And that case actually highlights the balance that comes into play between recognizing that the right of publicity is a separate property not right and recognizing the First Amendment rights of free speech and expression. In the Zucchini case, what happened was a television news show broadcast an unauthorized, it was an unauthorized broadcast of a performance um, that was the entire performance, a human cannonball performance, a 15 second performance, but it was the entire performance. And the Supreme Court held that the right, um, the First Amendment rights didn't prevent a finding that that unauthorized broadcast actually infringed the performer's right of publicity. So the balance between the right of publicity and First Amendment rights permeates this whole area and state jurisdictions typically do recognize First Amendment exceptions from state law protection. For example, you're typically allowed to use a person's name and persona in news reporting or an attempt to portray a person in a medium like a, full, a film, a play, a book, or on radio. So that's the right of publicity. The post-mortem right of publicity, as its name suggests, extends the right of publicity beyond an individual's lifetime and allows an individual's heirs or an individual's executor to enforce the rights that the law provides. As you'll see from the state survey that I submitted, what actually triggers the right of publicity varies among the states. Some states require an individual to have exploited those rights during their lifetime, in other words, to be a celebrity, while others don't require prior commercialization. Some states require that um, an individual's name or likeness must have commercial value at the time of or because of death. Um, others don't have that requirement. Regarding effective dates, most statutes are effective from the date of enactment. Some statutes have retroactive application. And in, time, in terms of the length of time, the right of publicity endures after death. That also varies widely across the states from 10 years to 100 years. And in some states that have the right of publicity that's rooted in common law, the extent of the protection is actually an uncertain duration. Most state statutes and case law specifically define the right of publicity as a property right that's freely descendable and transferable by contract, by will, by trust. And so while the postmortem right of publicity does give heirs important rights to enable them to profit from an individual's persona, to enable them to police unauthorized use of a person's persona. The flip side is that a specific postmortem right of publicity has had estate tax consequences. And why is that? Well, we all know that the gross estate includes the value of all assets, real or tangible, personal, I'm sorry, tangible or intangible, real or personal. And if the right of publicity is an intangible asset that transfers at death, it's likely going to be included in the gross estate, whether or not heirs are planning to exploit that right. That's really a separate question, right? Although some people have argued that it might force heirs to exploit a decedent's right of publicity in order to raise the funds necessary to pay the taxes that are generated by the inclusion of that right in the estate. So how significant an issue is this? Well, in the Michael Jackson case that Gerald will get into more details about, 
The estate initially valued Jackson's right of publicity on his estate tax return at $2,000. And the IRS initially came back on audit at $435 million. So you can see there's quite a potential divide that can be created there. Whitney Houston's estate is another example where the IRS initially increased the reported value of the right of publicity on her estate tax return at $200. They increased it to over $11.7 million. The singer Prince, his estate is currently embroiled in similar issues. So the, the issue could involve big bucks. Of course, not everybody has celebrity status of the magnitude of those celebrities, but nevertheless, the estate tax consequences could be substantial. Looking specifically at New York's brand new law, our law just became effective on May 29th, 2021. Um, and before the statute was enacted in New York, New York actually specifically did not recognize a post-mortem right of publicity. So literally overnight, you have this right created in New York. So a celebrity who died on May 28th in New York would have no asset in New York. A celebrity who died May 30th in New York, suddenly you have the statutory protection of the new legislation. And New York practitioners are all grappling with how best to plan for this newfound asset. And of course, part of the impetus for the panel this evening was to draw from practices in other jurisdictions that have had the postmortem right of publicity for some time to draw your attention to best practices. So let's take a look at the New York statute. Um, as I mentioned, it's effective May 29th, 2021 for those who die after the effective date who are domiciled in New York. The statute in New York was actually decades in the making and it reflects um, years of negotiations between the Motion Picture Association, the Screen Actors Guild, legislators from both sides of the aisle, communities in the media, entertainment and First Amendment communities. Um, the legislation in New York actually applies to two categories of deceased persons. It applies to deceased personalities and deceased performers. The post-mortem right of publicity is granted to deceased personalities. And there's a second provision related to digital replicas, think holograms, applicable to deceased performers. So what is a deceased personality? A deceased personality is defined as a person whose name, voice, signature, photograph or likeness has commercial value at the time of or because of their death, whether or not they exploited those characteristics during their lifetime. And the statute prohibits unauthorized use of the likeness for commercial purposes. The statute also protects a deceased performer. Deceased performers are more narrowly defined as also an individual domiciled in New York, you have to be domiciled in New York to garner the protection of the statute. So it's a deceased individual who regularly sang, acted, danced, or played a musical instrument for their livelihood. And the statute protects performers against an unauthorized digital replica of the performer that is likely to deceive. A digital replica means a computer generated electronic, electronic performance in which the individual in question didn't actually perform, but it's so realistic that a reasonable observer would believe it is that person. So for example, if a hologram company projected the image of a deceased musician before a live paying audience, that might be an example of a breach. However, the use of a digital replica will not be considered likely to deceive if there's a conspicuous disclaimer stating that the digital replica has not been authorized. The law in New York applies to acts of commercial exploitation occurring within New York. Violations under the statute are compensable by damages equal to the greater of $2,000 or the amount of the compensatory damages suffered plus profits plus potentially punitive damages. The length of time the postmortem right of publicity applies after death is 40 years. The rights are specifically defined as property rights, freely descendable and transferable by contract, by license, by gift, by trust or other testamentary instrument. And if you don't have an express testamentary transfer, the rights will pass under a residuary disposition. In order to enforce the postmortem rights of publicity in New York, 
a successor in interest has to register a claim with the Secretary of State and a cause of action will not arise before the successor in interest registers the claim. So again, prior to this passage of, uh, of New York's law, New York specifically declined to recognize a postmortem right of publicity. So the new law is really a big deal. And as I mentioned, um, typically, as I say, there's a balancing act in this arena between the right of publicity and First Amendment rights. And in keeping with that, there are exceptions in the New York statute for the use of, of an individual's persona for news, for public affairs, for a sports pro program, or other newsworthy, newsworthy or artistically valuable work. As I mentioned, about half the states in the country have the postmortem right of publicity. So the next question is, well, what do you do in the other half of the states? What happens if you're in a state that doesn't have the postmortem right of publicity or a state like New York before our law became effective, right? Because there were certainly many celebrities who died in New York before May 29th, 2021. And the answer is that even in the absence of a state statute that explicitly accords a postmortem right of publicity, most courts throughout the country have agreed that the right of publicity survives death and is enforceable by a decedent's estate. So practitioners in states where there's no specific law may look to other jurisdictions for guidance, or they could potentially look to federal law for relief. So for example, a false endorsement claim can potentially be brought under the Lanham Act um, as a form of unfair competition that's likely to cause con um, consumer confusion. Although federal claims haven't always been consistently successful. Um, so for example, in a case that I'll get to in a moment, the Elvis Presley v. Rusin case, and the New Jersey court found that one image of Elvis was a protectable trademark, but they rejected the argument that all images of Elvis were so protected. So the next question is, as a function of state law, when many different laws can potentially apply, which law does apply? And the nexus for application for a state statute is typically that a decedent was domiciled in that state, and typically the statute protects breaches within that state. And as we've just reviewed, that's exactly what the New York statute does. Um, interestingly enough, in the Michael Jackson case, Judge Holmes reported that there was a scuffle between the parties about which state's law the court should look to. And the judge reported that the IRS suggested that the court should look to several states. They said the court should look to every state in which Jackson's name and image could be exploited, but the court disagreed with that approach and said almost every court looks to the state of the decedent's domicile at the time of death. And of course, Jackson's um, state of domicile was California, so that was the law that applied. Now note, however, that some states have very broad protection and they protect people as long as the exploitation occurs within their state lines regardless if the individual was domiciled in their state or not. In other words, there are some states, for example, Hawaii, Indiana, Nevada, Washington state, where a decedent does not necessarily have to be domiciled in that state in order to garner the protection of that state's laws, as long as the exploitation is occurring in that state. And as a point of history, in 2017, there was a bill that was attempted um, to pass in the New York legislature that um, had a right of publicity for 40 years after someone's death, as our current statute does. But the statute that, that didn't pass in 2017 was much broader. It gave standing to sue to anybody whose identity was misappropriated in New York, regardless of that person's domicile. As I mentioned, that bill did not pass and the current New York law uses domicile as a prerequisite to using the law's protections. But let me give you an example of the use of the broad statute. So uh, the company that controlled Marilyn Monroe's estate attempted to use Indiana's broad statute, even though Marilyn died in California, her estate was probated in New York, the company sued a t-shirt manufacturer and a website operator, even though neither of them were located in Indiana. And the alleged breach of the statute was that they had manufactured t-shirts with Marilyn's image in, on it. And the t-shirts were sold at a Target in Indiana and the website operator was accessible in Indiana. 
Um, the court ultimately didn't have to opine on the constitutionality of the Indiana statute because it rejected the breach claims on the narrow grounds that none of California, New York or Indiana at the time of Monroe's death recognized a post-mortem right of publicity. Now, interestingly enough, after that case, California amended its laws to apply retroactively. And so the company brought a second claim under California law for breach of Monroe's post-mortem right of publicity against a photographer who had been distributing Marilyn's photographs in California. But the Ninth Circuit was ultimately able to dismiss that claim again on narrow grounds that Monroe's estate tax position was that she was a New York domiciliary, which at that time did not recognize a post-mortem right of publicity. So to me, this whole question of whether someone has a post-mortem right of publicity, even if one does not exist in their own state, is so interesting from an estate tax perspective. So in other words, can you say that someone has a post-mortem right that has value for estate tax purposes because they could potentially garner the protection of another state's laws, even though their own state doesn't offer them that protection? Something to bear in mind, though, is that those broad reaching statutes that protect domiciliaries and non domiciliaries alike have come under attack. There was a case involving the estate of Jimi Hendrix and a breach, a supposed breach of his postmortem right of publicity um, involving the sale in Washington state of unauthorized goods that bore Hendrix's image. Hendrix was domiciled in New York, which of course then did not have a postmortem right of publicity. And a federal court in Washington state said that Washington state choice of law clause was unconstitutional under the Commerce Clause. It encouraged forum shopping in violation of the due process and full faith and credit clauses. Um, and according to the court, and I'm quoting, to select the law of a state to which the individual is a stranger constitutes no less a random act than blindly throwing darts at a map on the wall. And although it may be hard to argue with that, that part of the decision was reversed on narrow grounds on appeal to the Ninth Circuit, which held that the commerce only took place within Washington state and so didn't impermissibly burden interstate commerce because the Washington state was held to have sufficient contacts with the actual controversy alleged, which was the sale in Washington state of those unauthorized goods. To me, however, even the decision on those very narrow grounds is so interesting because it means that a New York decedent's heirs could allege a breach of the Washington state statute, at least for activity within that state, even though New York did not accord the decedent that right. So, you know, again, it was not necessary because of the narrow grounds of the decision for the court to opine on the constitutionality of the Washington state statute but they did recognize the fact that the broad rights that Washington accorded, it, there, it raised questions about whether other states had to recognize those rights. Another choice of law case that I found a little puzzling was the case that I referred to earlier, the Elvis Presley v. Rusin case. And, and first of all, one of the most puzzling parts when I read that case was, what is the decision about Elvis Presley doing coming out of New Jersey? Well, the, the answer to that part of the question is that the um, Elvis Presley estate was seeking a preliminary injunction against an Elvis impersonation show in New Jersey. New Jersey's right of publicity is rooted in the common law. There is no statute, but the court was persuaded by reasoning from other jurisdictions that if there was a right that was exercised during an individual's lifetime so that it had concrete form on their death, which of course was, was the case with an enormous personality like Elvis, then that right should descend on the death of that individual like any other intangible property right. And therefore the court determined that Elvis's right of publicity survived his death and became part of his estate. Now, interestingly, Unlike the Marilyn Mon Monroe case, which focused on Marilyn's domicile on her date of death to determine whether she had a post-mortem right of publicity, the New Jersey court didn't discuss the fact that Presley was domiciled in Tennessee when he died or consider whether Tennessee had a post-mortem right of publicity. So there you have it, not entirely clear in terms of choice of law, although the vast majority of states do look at a decedent's domicile at date of death to determine whether a post-mortem right of publicity exists and its parameters. 
And, you know, of course, whether a state recognises, specifically recognises a post-mortem right of publicity can certainly play into valuation, as Mark can discuss further. So in other words, if the state does not have specific state law protection, that could possibly lead to a lower valuation. And in some states like Connecticut, like Michigan, like Minnesota, there are only federal court decisions. And as I mentioned, this is an area where it's a state law issue. Um, so in Minnesota, for example, there was a district court decision in Paisley Park v. Boxall, which was a lawsuit related to previously unreleased recordings of the singer Prince. And the federal court acknowledged that the Minnesota Supreme Court hadn't addressed whether the right of publicity survives an individual's death. And so they noted that when a federal court addresses an unresolved question of state law, they predict how a state Supreme Court would interpret the issue if it was before them. But it's just that, a prediction. It's not exactly the same as having specific state law. So again, that may play into a lower valuation. Of course, in California, not only do they have a right of publicity statute never to be outdone, they have a separate post-mortem right of publicity statute that protects deceased personalities for 70 years after they die. The rights are specifically defined as property rights, freely descendable and transferable. And that of course was the heart of the issue in the Michael Jackson case. And so on that note, let me turn it over to Gerald to talk further about that. Thank you, Sharon. <clears throat> What's in a name? Are we to believe as Shakespeare did that a rose by any other name would still smell as sweet or do we believe at what L.M. Montgomery's Anne of Green Gables said, that she did not believe that a rose would smell as sweet if it were called a skunk cabbage or a thistle? What's in a name? Or really more appropriately for our purposes, what is the value of a name when it is separated at death from the person who embodied it? That was the issue that was tackled by the IRS and the estate of Michael Jackson for the last decade at a cost of multi-millions of dollars on both sides, culminating in a nearly 300 page decision rendered by Judge Holmes in early May earlier this year. I, along with the late great Howard Weitzman, who I had the honor to work with as co-counsel, probate counsel for the estate of Michael Jackson since Michael's death, and a team of other very esteemed and experienced and highly distinguished, excellent attorneys and other professionals worked together on the preparation of the 706 through the audit, the appeals process and the month long trial that took place in February of 2017. And then the several years of extensive briefing that followed. And I have the battle scars to prove it, including having been the subject along with several individual members of my former law firm of an attempt by the IRS to assert preparer penalties against us in connection with the 706, even though none of us individual attorneys at the firm signed the return and we relied completely on professional appraisals in particular for the name and likeness prepared by Moss Adams. That was a first, it is my understanding for the IRS and fortunately and properly, the IRS withdrew its attempt, but not until after we had endured a number of depositions and discovery, including aggressive attempts to obtain our work product and attorney-client communications. I was lucky I got to be represented by Howard Weitzman in my deposition, so I got that. I got that honor, wouldn't have had that any other, in any other situation. Judge Holmes first tackled the issue of whether the right of publicity is included in the estate for estate tax purposes. That particular issue had not been addressed previously by a tax court. His conclusion was a resounding yes. He relied almost ha most heavily on California's postmortem right of publicity statute, Civil Code Section 3344.1, which states that the right of postmortem right of publicity is a property right that is freely descendable and transferable, although very limited by the terms of the statute itself, as well as the US Constitution, in particular, the First Amendment. Notably, Judge Holmes pointed out that the statute does state 
that the property right is transferable, just as the New York statute does. Judge Holmes did point out the quandary that, that this presents as the right of publicity, as Sharon pointed out, really is derived from the right of privacy. And by, by finding that the right of publicity is an asset includable in the estate for estate tax purposes, that means that heirs of a decedent who perhaps did not want his name and likeness exploited either during his life or after his death might be compelled to exploit the decedent's name and likeness just in order to pay the estate tax bill. I think we have to leave that up to our, our friends in Washington to deal with that issue. What is not known is whether Judge Holmes would have come to the same decision if Michael had died in a state that does not recognize a post-mortem right of publicity. I believe he would have found a way to do that. Judge Holmes next tackled the issue of the value of this unique and somewhat elusive asset, a very challenging issue in the best of circumstances, and most particularly difficult in our situation, where there was such a disparity between the icon that Michael Jackson was and the lack of marketability of his right of publicity during the last decade of his life. Michael Jackson was one of the most iconic and well-known figures in history. His thriller album to this day remains the best-selling album of all time. He died days before a sold out concert to take place in the United Kingdom. But notwithstanding the sold out concert, concert and notwithstanding the extensive efforts of his advisors, there was no merchandising deal in place at the time of Michael's death for the tour. And the income he had earned from his name and likeness in the years before his death was minimal, if any. On the other hand, the estate came from the brink of insolvency to being one of the highest earning celebrity dece deceased celebrity estates in history to this day. And this was the challenge that we faced. We recognized that using historical income, which is the standard approach, was going to result in a nominal number. The IRS initially asserted that Michael's name and likeness was worth nearly $500 million. I am not aware of any celebrity living or deceased who has sold his name and likeness for $500 million. How do you distinguish the value of the asset in the hands of the decedent at the moment of his death, as we're required to do, versus in our particular case, the unprecedented success achieved by Michael Jackson's executors. How do you separate the asset from its management? This was one of the issues that Judge Holmes pointed out makes it so difficult to value this asset. But Judge Holmes seemed to think it would be easy. You simply separate facts known or knowable on the date of death from those remoter in time or unforeseeable. And then you ask, what would a hypothetical buyer in possession of, of those facts offer then in a arm's length deal with a similarly knowledgeable hypothetical sell seller? Easy, right? Faced with the dichotomy that we had with the, the lack of historical income and the unprecedented success that was achieved after Michael's death, we recognize that we could not rely on the traditional approach to valuing this asset. But how would we value it? To come up with an arbitrary value? That would be precisely what would, what would lead us to prepare penalties. So our think tank decided that we should build a model, the business of marketing the post-death right of publicity. And who best to do that but the man who really created that business, Mr. Mark Rossler, who is going to speak to you today about his methodology. It was one of the best decisions that we made in connection with the estate tax return. And Judge Holmes', Judge Holmes decision evidences that in that he adopted Mr. Rossler's approach virtually wholesale. Of course, it didn't hurt that the IRS, the IRS's expert perjured himself more about that later. The second best decision we made at Mark Rossler's prodding, much to our chagrin, was to build the model based on Michael Jackson's 
entire 30 years history of his career. And that meant that we had to go through the painstaking efforts of recreating 30 years of contracts. And we did that because we had, fortunately, we had uh, Mr. Branca, whose team had worked on and off with Michael Jackson over the 30 years. And so we were able to rebuild some of the contracts as well as uh, Mr. Rossler doing research and having the information that he had to be able to, to recreate the economics of these deals. One of the other issues that we had to deal with in this case that was difficult was something called synergy. And that is, how do you measure the effect that separate assets have on each other's value? The commissioner's expert argued that the value of the other assets in Michael's estate, such as his copyrights and his musical compositions and his performances should be included in the value of name and likeness. The, the commissioner argued that these assets all belong to the estate and would be more valuable if they could be handled and, and exploited together. While the court posited that such an approach might be reasonable, that it is reasonable to think that a collection of intellectual property rights, such as copyrights, music, recordings, and images, might be more valuable if they were packaged together like a controlling block of stock, it was not applicable in our case. The assets were valued separately. Basically, it was that the IRS waited too long to raise this issue. The assets were valued separately on the estate 706. The IRS separately valued the assets in the notice of deficiency. And most importantly for the court, stipulations were reached between the IRS and the estate about many of the assets. The court noted that while the commissioner could have chosen to object to the description of the assets to be valued or refused to, val to stipulate to the value of some of the assets as opposed to the whole. What the commissioner is not allowed to do is to renege on his stipulation to cram the value of assets who value he already stipulated to into the value of assets that he did not stipulate to. Query whether the commissioner will take a different approach in another estate uh, of a celebrity at another time. Tax affecting was another issue. And this is, the, the issue here is that the rate used to discount projected cash flows to present value is generally derived from after-tax publicly available C-corporation information, but pass-through entities do not pay tax at the entity level. And so there is a discrepancy that arguably should be quote unquote tax effective for. The only case where the court has allowed tax affecting in valuation is the state of Jones versus commissioner TC memo 2019-101 at 41-42. The estate actually had an expert Nancy Fannin to testify at the trial about tax affecting and why it was important and why it should be considered. Judge Holmes did not dismiss the applicability of tax expecting entirely However, he said that it did not apply in our case. Judge Holmes said that whether to tax effect or not is a question of fact. And absent a preponderance of evidence that a C corporation would be the hypothetical buyer of the asset, tax affecting is not appropriate. In addition, Judge Holmes pointed out that even if it were appropriate, it would be almost an insurmountable challenge to be able to prove what that effect was. I will share with you a, a war story from the trial because you wouldn't get to hear it otherwise. Um, although it's, it's been written about and certainly Judge Holmes addressed it. Um, I have to tell you that this, this was really an unbelievable trial situation. I mean, we were in a month long trial. It was a modest courtroom in downtown, modest sized courtroom, federal courtroom in downtown Los Angeles. And it was filled every single day of those 30 days, it was filled with spectators and lawyers. One entire side was filled with IRS representatives of all rank and file. Some we dealt with in audit, some we dealt with in appeals, many I didn't recognize. And then of course there were our supporters, including one or two Michael Jackson fans. The, the counsel's bench was filled with attorneys, so much so that we had to have two rows. We couldn't sit in one row and you really couldn't even move your elbows. 
it was the second to the last day of the trial at the, in the end of the day. And Mr. Weitzman was cross-examining the tax, um, the IRS's expert. It was towards the end of the day, it was a heated cross-examination. And I was sitting next to him, feeding him questions, follow-up questions. And I, I'm told afterwards, I didn't know this at the time, but I'm told afterwards that there was a note being passed around the courtroom in, in back of us in the galley. Person to person to person, the note came to me and I was asked to hand it to Mr. Weitzman. And Mr. Weitzman being really one of the most skilled trial attorneys I have ever had the luck to work with, opened the note without flinching in his cross-examination. And he said, your honor, in, in the middle, he said, your honor, I'd like to take a recess. And there was this buzz around, what do you mean a recess? It's our, you know, the IRS, that's our, our expert being cross-examined. We're on the second to the last day of trial. It's almost the end of the day. What are you talking about? And Mr. Weitzman said, I'm exhausted. And of course, Mr. Weitzman was in his 70s. The other uh, attorney, the other head of our uh, tax litigation team was Abe Salkin, who was also in his 70s. And what was Judge Holmes to do? He said, I have older lawyers. I'm going to give you a recess. And so Mr. Weitzman whisked me into the, the lawyer's room outside the courtroom and showed me the note. And the note said, I happen to know that the IRS's expert perjured himself. And I have the evidence. And so we went into, we decided to go into chambers to disclose to, to Judge Holmes and the IRS what we had just discovered. I won't tell you what was said in chambers. Suffice it to say that when we came back into the courtroom under Mr. Weitzman's cross-examination, the IRS's expert admitted to the perjury and um, Judge Holmes did reject, although Judge Holmes did reject, the estate's um, motion to have his testimony stricken, his, his value stricken, um, given the perjury. Judge Holmes did say that he would take the fact of the perjury into account in, in his um, evaluation. I do note, however, that in Judge Holmes's conclusion in rejecting the IRS's valuation and adopting, again, almost wholesale, um, the estate's um, valuation methodology, he did put the perjury aside and he said aside from the perjury, he found the IRS's position to be completely unpersuasive and unreliable. They valued the wrong asset. They tried to cram you know, other assets in and he thought it, it was had some ridiculous hypotheses. And the rest is history, at least for the estate of Michael Jackson. And now I will turn it over to Tom to talk about some planning opportunities especially given, given the events in DC today? Well, I, I, I have a feeling, Gerald, the events in DC today, if they lead to anything, will be more limiting than anything else. But that is such a great story. I, I chuckle at it every time I hear it. Um, uh, so I'm gonna make the most obvious statement of the day. With the right of publicity, we are talking about an asset that in the world of estate planning, is relatively new. When you think about Michael Jackson's estate case being really only the second case that even mentions really the use of the right of publicity in an estate and is it an asset. We have now certainly a much better body of law than we did on factors that go into valuation, but one case does not make a body of law or really give us in the estate planning industry a lot of guidance on what are all the factors that may come into play, not just for someone in the music industry, but a celebrity in any other industry, motion picture, television, sports, how are all those things going to weigh? And, and more importantly, what is the guidance we have at this point on what will work in helping us define, segregate, control that value, and what won't work? We have great range of techniques, at least for the time being in the estate planning world, but which, which are the ones that are really going to be effective? We don't know any of that yet, 
And of course, we have this wide variation as Sharon so aptly explained, underlying this, the, the creation of the property right itself, wide variation in state law. Um, so we're really kind of traveling in an unknown world to a degree. Uh, as, as we'll talk and I'll talk about some of these techniques that may in fact be very effective and how you position yourself to that. But before we get there, there is a starting point as any estate planning attorney with a client when you're dealing with a particularly important asset. And that is the age old question of what does the client want? And that's what where you should really start, right, is with the client, what do you want? And for any asset, really the questions are, who do you want to receive it and benefit from it? And who do you want to control it? And both are really, really important questions when it comes to the right of publicity. So the particularly unique aspect of, you know, what do you want to have happen to it not only involves who is going to receive it, but a question that is one of the many we don't have an answer to right now, which is, can the individual control how it is used? Because if they can control how it is used, they're going to be able to control how it is valued. Um, the, you know, the, the question that, or the, the reference that Gerald made to the standard for um, valuing any asset, willing buyer, willing seller, being aware of all the facts, uh, that suggests along with another standard that we're all familiar with, highest and best use, that the assumption is that a willing buyer is going to think about what's everything I can possibly do with this asset to make money, even if the decedent did not do that. So question one, does the decedent's pattern of how, it is, how their right of publicity was used, what sorts of things they did, does that matter at all? And can they put a wrapper on it in some way to say, glad to have my name and likeness used in industry A and industry B or with these particular products, but you shall not use it for any other purpose. Will that work? Will it work to say you shall not use it at all? Period. No, you know, the only thing you're allowed to do is prevent other people from using it, but you're not going to affirmatively commercialize it. Those are questions we just don't know the answer to. I think for me personally, intuitively, it seems like something an individual should be able to do, uh, especially with a right this personal. And I'm certainly going to take that approach until someone tells me I'm wrong. Um, because of course, if you don't say anything, you've missed the opportunity. But, but that is a very, very critical question. The second question, of course, who do you want to control it? And, and here, that is something that I think we all know in the estate planning world, the more complex the asset, the more important that question is. And no doubt this is a complex asset. Uh, it's going to take some creativity, innovation, connections, people who know people if you actually do want to commercialize it, and it's going to take people to manage that. Um, it, it really is, in many respects, a business. And I think that not only leads to the conclusion that you have to be very careful about who you put in charge and make sure those people are capable and going to do what the individual wants them to do, but it also suggests that it should be treated as a business. And, and that leads, I think, to a lot of the planning that we have out there. So I would say as a first step, if at this point in an individual's life or whatever they're doing with their right of publicity, with their name and likeness, if it's not set up as a business with a business structure around it, put one around it. And then 
you do turn to this good set of well-established techniques for transfer tax planning of business interests, subject, of course, to what they may do in Washington with a swath of those, uh, things like sales to grantor trusts, et cetera. But let's assume for the time being that that won't come to fruition. And, and let's talk about some of these techniques and, and how you deal with this as a business asset. Well, what do we do with business assets? What, what are the basic techniques that we've always used, whether it's a C corporation, an S corporation, LLC, or partnership? You won, you have the value creating asset in the entity, and then you divide the ownership. You, that way you keep control in one place and you divide the ownership as you want it to among the family. You think about dividing control because of course, in the world of valuation discounts, if you don't have control or if you have less control, there may be opportunity to reduce value. Uh, Gerald referred to something very important that is I think a general concept that I've talked about in a number of just business um, contexts and she, she called it synergy. The, IRS's attempt to view all the assets as one and the synergy between those assets is what adds value. That creeps its way into the IRS's valuation approach in a, in a lot of different ways. And I've often referred to the, the counteracting, the, 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 the way to counter that as disaggregation. So simple example in the business context, there is a whole body of law now that if you have 40% uh, in uh, controlling or 40% voting interest in an entity in your name as a decedent, and the other 40% is in a marital trust that your spouse left you, you do not have 80% control for estate tax purposes in the eyes of the IRS. You have two separate 40% interests. That's disaggregation. It's, it's, I think, a particularly useful concept here because of the various elements that go into value when you talk about anyone's right of publicity and the ability to commercialize their name and likeness. And uh, by the way, in, in the materials I have, uh, Gerald referred to the uh, court commenting on this question of synergy, synergy of all the assets and putting them all together. The actual quote from the opinion is at the top of page four of the materials, if you want to refer to that. And that's my section of the materials on estate planning. Um, but here, you know, why take the chance that the next judge is not going to view this the way that Judge Holmes viewed it? So can you separate out elements of this? Now, what the elements are, are going to depend on who the celebrity or slash personality is. It may involve a music portfolio. It may involve a portfolio of written works. It may involve a portfolio of audiovisual works. Um, it may involve just endorsement contracts and then separately the right of publicity that can be marketed for other endorsement contracts. Think about how you can separate those out. Um, there are any number of ways it, it might be done. Uh, you also, of course, have trademarks that may have independent value that you don't want to mix in with other things. You may have, at least in the sporting world where, where I have most of my familiarity, memorabilia. And that was one decision we've made early on in one situation. Is let's keep the memorabilia off to the side. Um, you know, the, the, the jersey that got worn in this championship game, you know, and there's many of them, uh, let's not mix that in with everything else because maybe that's something we can just deal with separately and have it owned separately. Uh, many celebrities use third-party management companies to manage all of this. Uh, one idea is to have your own management company charge a significant amount of uh, money to manage all this and have that owned outside the estate. And that siphons off a lot of the benefit. 
you may just have a more of a commercial commercialization entity and a separate holding company for the right of publicity itself with a license between the two, again, separately owned. And especially if contracts have a very long life and will have significant value when the person dies, uh, those contracts will just be looked at separate and apart from the right of publicity if it's owned in a different way. And of course, in either case or both cases, the decedent's ownership may be much smaller than 100%. It may be much smaller than 50% by that time because you've made transfers. And then you know, then you move as part of that to the transfers themselves. And of course, there's a whole variety of them that we typically turn to. And this is where things get a little depressing. If you read the House Ways and Means Committee bill uh, or markup, I guess I should call it, but, you know, sales to a grantor trust, gifts followed by sales, uh, any of those kinds of assets for something which is still a young and growing asset. Uh, maybe grats, because there may be a good steep growth curve early on in the individual's commercialization. And, which is very, a very important point with grants, uh, grats, they'll get most of it back. Um, you think about it, the current value will keep coming back to them, and it's only the excess appreciation that will leave. So all those kinds of techniques that we typically use for business assets have relevance here, private annuities possibly, uh, any, any number of these things. So that I think is the approach that until we learn more and have more um, evidence of what some of the things are successful and what isn't successful that we'll be using. A Couple of, of important points just to watch out for and questions that come up. One is of course, section 2036, uh, in, in particular, Section 2036A2, don't you have to take the, the celebrity out of controlling this entirely uh, because of the Powell case? Uh, I would argue, uh, well, I would say, first of all, that you're not going to get the celebrity to do it. Um, if you do, it'll be a rare case. But second of all, you've created a business. You've created an operating business that is retaining people to manage it. You should be outside of 2036A2 and Powell because you've made a transfer for adequate and full consideration and have a legitimate non-tax business purpose to that entity. Very hard to argue in my mind that there's not a legitimate non-tax business purpose. What about the, the simple situation of a celebrity, an athlete who's got one or two endorsement contracts? And that's all they have and they get some money from it, they go on for a period of years, maybe they're renewed, maybe they're not, they're paid to wear the equipment, they're paid to do some advertising, they're pay, pay, paid to have it at the tournaments they in, engaged in. Well, remember that to a large degree, and this is the IRS's own point of view, is personal service income. So if it's personal service income, uh, one, if that's all it is, it's probably not astronomical numbers, any, nothing like Michael Jackson could be or some celebrities could be. Uh, and two, the IRS is gonna treat it as personal service income, that's their tendency, and you're gonna have it be income, which argues that the actual right of publicity by itself, if really all it's producing is services, maybe you can argue a small value there if you have them separated and get the right of publicity transferred out at a small value licensed to the entity that is managing the individual's personal services. And then at death, the personal services end, the right of publicity is largely out of the estate. Um, I would uh, just remind people too that that concept of personal service income is one you have to be sensitive to generally and making sure that a fair amount of what is coming in is allocated to that. Uh, that's another way you could lose with the IRS if you're basically claiming you're transferring all this value and not claiming any of it 
claiming all of it is royalties or business income and none of it is personal service income. It's an income tax question, but it's one you need to worry about. So, you know, this part of it, I don't think is rocket science. It's applying the things that we know and we've done for a while to this particular asset. Maybe the science in it is trying to get it well positioned to treat it as a business so that we can do those things. And then you go in and you get the best valuation people you can and try to figure out how to value it and how much you can move during life. And that's where folks like Mark come in. So uh, we're going to turn it over to Mark at this point. Well, thank you, Tom. And thank you, Sharon and Gerald. Um, I think uh, the three of you did a great job of laying out the landscape of um, not only um, celebrities and the various IP rights that they have, but also the, um, the landscape of the different statutes, uh, particularly New York, which we're really talking about today. But I think the first thing I'll, I'll comment on was what our task was. And our task was to, um, to look at the revenue projections uh, that we would see from uh, Jackson's ROP rights and uh, write a publicity uh, revenue. And with the celebrity, uh, what we're dealing with are celebrities that have various intellectual property rights, particularly copyrights, trademarks, and right of publicity. So the, um, uh, it is possible with, the, with a celebrity, uh, whether you're a, a famous artist like an Andy Warhol from a place like New York, uh, that, the, uh, that the significant, most significant value that you have uh, would be in the copyrights that you have. If you're, uh, if you're John Lennon, uh, a similar situation, a musician with, uh, with predominantly the value would be associated with his, uh, with his copyrights. And we can think of famous designers that uh, build up trademarks around their, um, uh, their persona, uh, whether it's uh, Ralph Lauren or anyone like that, the primary value on that celebrity would be uh, might be their trademarks. And of course, the right of publicity, uh, as, as we talked about a lot in this uh, presentation, is, uh, is kind of an overall overarching uh, umbrella, so to speak, that covers a lot of aspects of a, of a persona. So we were tasked going in with, uh, with identifying the value on the right of publicity of Michael Jackson, who happened to be domiciled, of course, in the state of California. And, uh, and uh, as I said, with a musician like a John Lennon, in our initial assessment, the primary value would be associated with his copyrights. Uh, so the first thing we did was identify that there could be uh, various trademarks that would overlap with Michael Jackson's right of publicity. And we called those associated trademarks, and those would be trademarks uh, uh, both both uh, common law trademarks and federally registered trademarks. Um, in a brief nutshell, of course, federally registered trademarks would be uh, registrations that uh, someone like Michael Jackson would have. And there was an extensive list of those uh, trademarks that he had, but also common law trademarks that he would develop, so the estate would develop some type of uh, ownership and interest in those uh, um, in the trademarks associated with his name and likeness by virtue of their use. So initially, we made the decision that we had to, uh, to lump in some of the, the associated trademarks uh, along with the right of publicity. And um, so the, um, uh, the next thing we did, we, uh, we did have to take a look at the, um, uh, the right of publicity status of somebody like a Michael Jackson. And, and I think there were some questions earlier, would, the, would these values change if we were in a, a jurisdiction like, uh, like New York? And the answer to that is undoubtedly it would. Uh, if there was no right of publicity protection, it would certainly affect the value. We've uh, valued a number of uh, well-known celebrities uh, um, in, in situations against the IRS. Uh, that 
involved uh, the state of New York and their domicile in New York. And it, uh, it, it, it is a factor in the ability to protect those intellectual property rights. It doesn't mean that you can't protect the, the, the rights of a particular celebrity, but it, uh, it all goes to the value and what, uh, what, uh, what happens in an arm's length transaction that someone might, um, might pay for those intellectual property rights. And if there is no right of publicity protection, and, and we, see that, um, we see that a lot now with the various uh, uh, celebrities that we represent that are domiciled in New York, uh, people question, um, you know, how well we can protect those intellectual property rights. And, and often there's a, uh, uh, what I call a portfolio of intellectual property rights that, uh, with a celebrity that, uh, that involve, as we said, the copyrights, the trademarks, and the right of publicity. But, but when the right of publicity is lacking, it does, uh, it does affect that. Um, the next, um, the next part that we moved on to was once we established there's a right of publicity and we look at the, um, we, we look at the revenue that's being generated and historically we look back um, on, on the different deals that a celebrity has done is, is, inner, is uh, separating the right of publicity from personal services and almost inevitably during one's lifetime um, a celebrity uh, is involved in various aspects of personal services, whether it's a, uh, whether it's appearing in a movie, whether it's uh, appearing on a, on a commercial, whether uh, uh, some type of social media type event, personal appearance, autograph signing, uh, all of those involve both an aspect of personal services and right of publicity. So it's an analysis of that, as, as Gerald said earlier, um, what, what happens when that name is, is separated from the person at death. So we, we focus in on those uh, contracts. When we look at, uh, when we look at uh, a celebrity like Michael Jackson, we look at the history. And as, as um, I think Gerald mentioned earlier, one of the things that we, that we decided to do was look at 30 years of history of Michael Jackson. That was the really the only time that we've looked at a celebrity in evaluation matter um, on, uh, you know, beyond um, uh, a 10 year scope. Typically it's more like five years when there's a body of, um, of, of, of uh, revenue and contracts that one can analyze. Uh, you can really get sufficient data that gives you um, a comfort level in the evaluation that you come up with. In the Michael Jackson situation, when we looked at the time period between 1999 and 2009, which was, the, uh, of course, when he died in 2009, it just so happened that 10-year uh, period prior to 2009 was uh, was some uh, was pretty turbulent for Michael Jackson. Uh, turbulent in the sense that he was uh, fighting off different uh, allegations um, uh, involving. Um, his personal conduct. So because of all that, uh, we didn't think we could get a very good, um, uh, a, a very good feel around what type of revenue that, uh, that Michael had. So we um, came up with uh, a number of discussions that we had with the, the dream team of uh, lawyers and advisors and professionals that we had, and we got permission to go back uh, 30 years. The the nice part about that was um, uh, uh, Michael Jackson's career started about the same time I started at CMG. So uh, a lot of the companies that uh, Michael worked with, uh, we also worked with over the years and we had a good feel. Uh, we had to recreate some of those contracts and, uh, and look at them. We, we had the uh, advantage of uh, comparing uh, contracts we had uh, negotiated for clients like Elvis Presley, James Dean, Marilyn Monroe. Uh, so that was a big factor in our ability to, to really look at those 30 years and to reconstruct that data. And, um, and uh, what we did, uh, obviously Michael Jackson being the performer that he was, 
there were a lot of um, uh, there were a lot of contracts out there, uh, a lot of major endorsement deals, uh, merchandising contracts, uh, uh, music contracts. There were situations where I talked about how we had to analyze the personal services versus the right of publicity component. There were other situations where we also had to take into consideration the music component of, of, of those contracts. And we had to come up with the value uh, that, that was reflective on what was earned in those, uh, in those contracts. And um, um, some of the contracts were, um, uh, we probably had, we probably had over 50% of the contracts and some of those contracts uh, spelled out uh, what, what he'd get for personal services, what he'd get for uh, a normal contract. There were situations that you could look at a contract that he did, for example, a poster contract, and you could see that, oh, um, this, is, this is the value when he's not involved in any personal service aspect of it. And this is, this is the value just with respect to the, uh, the, the name and likeness or the right of publicity. So um, um, as we analyzed those over the years, we, uh, we were able to get a, um, um, we thought we had a very good feel for um, um, what, um, what he was able to command during those years. And uh, we ultimately came up with a yearly average um, over those 30 years. And, um, and <clears throat> the, um, the revenue, um, you know, was roughly about um, uh, the, 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 the revenue with respect to the right of publicity was about $2.7 million per year and um, over those 30 years. And um, obviously, when we talked about at the outset, uh, what, the, um, what the, the estate valued the right of publicity with, uh, when they looked at um, the original appraisers, um, who I still think did a, um, um, a very good job of analyzing what the right of publicity was worth when they took a five-year average. But the, the average they came out with was obviously a fraction of, uh, of the 30-year the average that we came out with of $2.7 Their Their five-year average was a couple thousand dollars a year um, because, as I said, their their was not much revenue generated from Michael Jackson's right of publicity and what we called the associated trademarks uh, at, at the at the moment of death. And there was no question that um, that fans around the world um, loved his music, um, bought his records, uh, bought his albums, and generated a substantial amount. But that was all. Uh, separately accounted for by the estate in terms of, of, of evaluation. So um, um, we, um, as I said, we came up with this value of $2.7 million. And what we decided to do um, was uh, come up with uh, um, different periods of time and, and weight those periods of time um, um, and um, uh, so we could come up with a valuation as, as something that older, obviously, when it were back in the 30 year time period, the 20 to 30 year period, we did not want to wait that as much as we waited the, uh, the type of revenue that he could generate um, uh, closer to the time of his death. So, um, uh, as I said, we looked at various comparables. We looked at uh, revenue that was... Um, uh, generated by other celebrities that we thought were uh, were comparable. The three uh, most comparable ones were Elvis Presley, Marilyn Monroe, and James Dean. We had good data uh, with respect to that. We uh, we we looked closely at how that data mirrored uh, the the data that uh, that we were able to glean from the uh, the Michael Jackson um, uh, contracts and the revenue. So um, we. Um, um, we also had to make some assumptions. Um, we had to make some assumptions that there would be cooperation on the music, because as I said at the outset, when you're dealing with a performer like uh, like Michael Jackson, and the um, and he's a musician, and uh, 
and his music is uh, is much more valuable. That, that those intellectual property rights associated with music are much more valuable than the intellectual property rights associated with his uh, with his right of publicity and uh, those associated trademarks. So we uh, we made an assumption and we relied on that assumption throughout our analysis that the, the that there would be cooperation between whoever owned those music rights and the whoever owned the right of publicity because when we valued that we had to make an assumption that there could be a different entity that ultimately owned the the music rights versus owning the um uh the other uh, intellectual property, notably the right of publicity and, uh, and trademarks. Uh, so we, um, we did all that. And um, we, um, um, we, we also looked at, uh, we looked at what, um, um, it, when we were, after we did all that, we were faced with the task of, uh, coming up with what we thought would be the post-death revenue. So when we looked at all the past to get the comparables and, and do our analysis on that, we had to process that to come up with what the post-death revenue would be. And um, we, um, um, we came up with some, um, some numbers. Um, we, uh, first we had to look at the, um, uh, we had to look at the marketability factors of, of Michael Jackson post death, and the first thing that we did was we looked at his uh, reputation and appeal. Uh, we knew that there were some bad conduct factors that we analyzed, and we uh, paid particular attention to historically what had happened with people that um, were uh, uh, celebrities that uh, had uh, had uh, bad conduct factors. And those um, those factors um, were a um, uh, were confirmed with some of the other analysis we did. We looked at what we call Q scores, which are the um, which is a Q scores are a company that does a likability versus uh, a, a dislike of various celebrities, and they do a, a fairly in depth analysis, and it's generally accepted in the business. We looked at various Q scores over the years on what uh, what Michael Jackson um, um, how he rated in the in those years, particularly uh, shortly before his death and right after his death. Uh, we looked at uh, the other rights holders uh, and the limitations. Um, again, back to the music um, aspect of it, knowing that uh, assuming that there would be um, um, cooperation. Uh, we looked at the past uh, comparable deals, and we looked with um, we looked at what we thought uh, could be uh, companies or products that would have uh, that would have synergy. So when we um, um, we did all that, we also um, um, we um, looked at the um, um, a mark what we called a marketability analysis um, uh, post death. And we looked at um, his ability to um, to repair his reputation, um, and and that and that we we thought that that was possible on uh, uh, depending on certain factors, and then we um, and then we came up with what's um, often referred to as a post death boom, and a post death boom in the uh, when you deal with celebrities um, upon their death, uh, there's often a significant amount of attention on a on a celebrity, and not only attention on what they've accomplished during their life, but on what their lasting legacy is going to be. So, um, and and that can result um, in a um, in an increase in business around a particular celebrity, and particularly if you're dealing with a situation where there's a very dramatic, um, um, uh, untimely death. And we've seen that obviously over the years. Uh, with I, I'm sorry to, to interrupt, but um, I think that if you could finish up your section, cause I want to sum up and then I see there's a bunch of questions in the Q and A okay. Um, okay. we, we want to get to, thank you. Okay, I'll wrap things up in about three minutes. So 
Um, I, as far as the post-death boom, um, the dramatic circumstances around Michael's uh, passing, uh, we thought created a post-death boom that would, um, that would bat last uh, anywhere from two to four years. And we ultimately uh, taken into consideration all of those factors. We came up with a 10 year analysis of, uh, uh, of the projected revenue that started in year one of uh, $2.5 million and rose to um, with the post death boom to about 3 million in year three and then declined at about a 10% um, um, uh, level after that. And, um, and the last thing that we looked at was um, an identification of the, uh, what was necessary to do to maintain that revenue and estimated expenses. And the, what was necessary was of course um, um, a, a proper team, um, a proper team that was well-funded to, uh, to protect these intellectual property rights. And we came up with an analysis of what the expenses should be. And um, the last thing I really have to say on that is people often ask me if, uh, if, if this analysis is a definitive um, valuation on a particular celebrity. And uh, I think what we're seeing uh, today, uh, we're seeing a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of developments uh, since 2009, since uh, Michael's death, when we valued that at the moment of death. And we're in the year uh, 2021, we're 12 years later, technology's changed. So um, as, uh, as Sharon mentioned earlier, holograms, um, we really call it virtual humans uh, now. Um, holograms is kind of an old technology, but virtual reality. <laughs> are, I'm an old uh, gal, sorry. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the whole hologram, the whole hologram technology has been around for a long time, but what you're talking about now with, with the advent of 5G and, and uh, the augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, the, the various celebrities that have passed away uh, now have really an additional um, um, career. Uh, so with that in mind, I'll turn it over to, back to you, Sharon. And, Thank you, and that's fascinating. Question. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so great to, to have your insights about what actually happened in that case and, and how you valued um, Michael Jackson's uh, name and image. So let me just um, sum up with uh, eight, some lessons that I hope we could take away from the panel and then we will open it up to um, questions. So in terms of planning, um, after hearing Tom speak, I'm kind of reminded of the old adage that there's nothing new under the sun. And the same tried and true techniques that we've been using for many years with other assets like business assets, slicing and dicing, trying to divide ownership so you minimise estate tax values seem to be just as applicable in this context too, although of course there are nuances that you need to take into account, as Tom mentioned. Um, secondly, as Gerald mentioned, I think it's so interesting that Judge Holmes pointed out that you have to distinguish between the value of an asset and the value of its management. And although it's a 271 page decision, I commend it to you all to read. It's highly entertaining. For example, the judge pointed out that when the assets were no longer under Jackson's control, they were managed with stunningly greater competence than they had been in Jackson's own hands. And the crux of the matter, the crux of the valuation was that on, at his date of death, Jackson's reputation was in tatters because of the stigma associated with him. So from the estate's perspective, when the IRS looked at what actually happened after Michael Jackson's death, that was just hindsight. And according to this um, judge who, who, who wrote this very entertaining decision, it wasn't even 2020 hindsight. It was more like hindsight of an eagle or a spy satellite. So of course, when you value assets on the date of death, it's generally inappropriate to ascribe value based on post-death events, except to the extent that those post-death events were reasonably foreseeable on the date of death. But the court noted how difficult it is to separate the value of an asset that requires active management and distinguish between the value of the asset and the value of the management. Now, Michael Jackson was an extreme case. His reputation was in tatters. In the last 10 years of his life, he received no revenue, almost no revenue related to his name and image, despite, as the judge put it, being one of the most well-known persons on earth. 
But despite the fact, put aside the fact that's an extreme case, there's probably arguments to be had in the future about why an individual's post-mortem right of publicity valued as of the date of death shouldn't be inflated with regard to post-death events because success after death, one might argue, is at least attributable in part to the management of that asset after death as opposed to its value on the date of death. Next, I think that like with any other asset, considering insurance to offset the increased value in an estate because of the inclusion of these rights may merit consideration. Um, next, in terms of managing post-mortem publicity rights, just as individuals are increasingly appointing specialty advisors in their dispositive documents to manage assets like business assets or artwork or digital assets, it may be prudent to appoint a publicity rights advisor who has particular expertise in this arena in order to maximize the value for the heirs and minimize conflicts among the beneficiaries. Next point is, um, as many of you know, I have particular expertise in the divorce arena and it occurs to me that in the marital context, the right of publicity should be considered an asset and dealt with in marital agreements. Next, the success in the Michael Jackson case, and not to detract from the phenomenal representation, I mean, $2,000 on the 706, $435 million on audit, final decision from the court, $4 million, spectacular decision, phenomenal representation, but there was some luck associated with that verdict. First of all, the IRS appraiser was not credible. As Gerald said, he perjured himself. His testimony was basically disregarded. The IRS shot themselves in the foot with the synergies argument, as Gerald and as Tom said. The court said it would be perfectly reasonable to think about bundling these types of rights, the value of which together is more than the value if you, put, if you, if you valued them each separately. So I think that the safest course of action is to be proactive, as Tom mentioned, and I like his term disaggregate, disaggregate the assets. So you sort of undercut that synergies argument. Um, but also, if you haven't done that, or even if you have, to try to agree as much as possible on the values before, um, you know, it gets to, to court so that you could undercut the synergies argument because as Gerald said, the judge in this case said he wasn't going to allow the IRS to go back on a stipulation as to values that had already been agreed to. So what went to trial was only three values, disputed assets with, with three. One of them was name and image. And so they both basically shot themselves in the foot with regard to the argument that they should combine everything. Um, and, you know, maybe in the future, they'll the IRS will make sure that well, certainly that their appraiser won't perjure himself, but maybe also that he's properly prepared. So I think it sort of it behooves everyone to take it upon themselves to be proactive. Um, finally, just like in the business context, I think you'll, you'll, you'll have heard this particularly from Mark, but having a qualified appraisal is really key. You know, apart from the perjury, as Gerald said, the, the court rejected the testimony of the IRS expert as fantasy. He, they found that he valued the wrong assets. So he included with name and image other assets that shouldn't have been in there, you know, copyrights, trademarks, endorsement rights, royalty pools. He included revenue streams that was just unforeseeable at the date of Jackson's death because he glossed over the fact that Jackson was accused of these heinous acts. And I just have to read from your quote from the judge because if, this is, gives you a sense of how entertaining the, the, the judgment is. He said, regarding the belief of the IRS expert that Neverland could be used for a theme park, he said, to any reasonable observer, however, Neverland was more of a recent crime scene than a future wonderland. And common sense suggests that a home owned by an alleged child molester where the alleged molestation took place would be less than an ideal spot for a theme park for children. So I would say, and he also miscalculated the value of the asset, said the judge. So key to have the qualified appraisal. And the last thing that I'll say before I turn it over to, to David for the Q&A is the issue of tax affecting I find quite interesting. And that issue, you know, as Gerald raised is the question is, should you take into account the form of the business entity in determining the fair market value? 
In other words, should you take into account the prospect of a potential tax burden, how a potential tax burden would affect a prospective buyer um, and the price that they would be willing to pay? Because the assets in question in the Michael Jackson estate were held in pass through entities, which doesn't have an entity layer tax, unlike a C corporation, which has those two layers of tax. But when everybody used their cash flow analysis and their projections, um, how you do that, the discounted cash flow projections are often derived from publicly available C corporation data, which does include the tax effect. So that mismatch between not including the taxes and including the taxes, that's what the expert argues should be corrected or tax affected. And they actually argue that the buyer, the hypothetical buyer of these um, assets would be a C corporation and therefore you needed to reduce the cash flows by the income tax liability that would be paid by that hypothetical C corporation buyer. Um, the court basically rejected that and held only by a preponderance of the evidence, but nevertheless held that tax affecting was not appropriate because the estate failed to persuade the court that it would be a C corporation who was a buyer. Um, and as Gerald noted, pointed out that it's very difficult as a factual issue to demonstrate even a reasonable approximation of what the effect of tax affecting should be. So with that, David, I, I see that there is some Q&A in the chat and um, I will turn it over to you to see what, uh, what questions people are asking. You're on mute, David. Okay, thank you, Sharon. And uh, thank you, um, Mark and, and Tom and uh, Gerald. Um, we actually have some very good questions here. So I'll try to run through as many as I can. Um, one that I found uh, very interesting, uh, this may be asking Mark to reveal his secret sauce, but how does one find comparables to set a fair market value for a right of publicity appraisal when there are so few instances, so few of such of uh, these such instances, and when there are transactions are private deals with very little, if any, public data available? Well, as I as I mentioned, we probably had access to fifty percent of the um, of the contracts that Michael actually signed during his life. And the other 50% that we had to come up with uh, uh, our own determination on what we thought the value was, uh, probably uh, uh, probably over half those we had uh, done business with during the same time that Michael was doing business with them. So we had a good feel for a lot of these contracts. And we were, we were when you analyze the, 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 the big number of contracts that we did, with respect to this case over 30 years, uh, we had a pretty good comfort level that the numbers we were coming up with were numbers that really um, uh, made sense. And, and I think that we were able to convince the court of that, that, that our numbers were realistic and, um, and therefore we were, we were fortunate. And it was, as, as Gerald said earlier, we had a, um, we had a, a a well-financed operation that uh, gave all of us the ability to do the necessary research and put together the the proper uh, valuation. And, and as we all know, the the numbers were significant. There's a lot of money at stake, and there's a lot of money spent on preparing this in, in the proper way. So I think, in a way, it almost comes down, as 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 Sharon said, to choosing the right appraiser. Um, someone who knows the business and know and knows this information. Well, thank, thank, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is there was a question that uh, someone asked uh, of Sharon, which I actually I was thinking about as well. If you have a decedent who dies domiciled in a state that doesn't clearly require post mortem actions to be brought in the state of domicile. Can the heirs owning a right of publicity create a planning structure, um, perhaps something um, described by Tom, in another jurisdiction after death to take advantage of more favorable tax and right of publicity statutes? Uh, I will make some comments and then turn it over to, to Tom for his thoughts. I, I certainly have read about people doing this and they don't wait until after death. <laughs> they set these things up right now. Um, 
and uh, and and that's one way to disaggregate, as he said, as as Tom was describing, to sort of the slice and dice, and doing it in a jurisdiction that has more liberal rights could only be helpful. Um, I haven't actually seen it done. I've read about it, but Tom, have you have you seen that done? I have again heard about it being done, and of course, I'm looking at it from the planning perspective. And remember, there there are two aspects that you see in these post mortem right of publicity statutes. There's the right to have a property a asset, an asset a property right that you can pass to someone and then they can commercialize it. But there is also the right to prevent others from using it. And I think in the first context, this question of, you know, are you in a state law? Are you in a state where you're not really entitled to be? Can you take advantage of their law? I'm not sure that's gonna come up that much because I'm not sure the IRS cares. Uh, it's, it's more, I think, in the second aspect where uh, someone's protect or suing to protect the rights claiming the benefit of a statute other than the domicile and where the person lived and that's where you're going to have the law develop where someone, the, the uh, alleged offender argues, well, you know, you're arguing rights that you don't have because you're not entitled to have them. And this is why. Uh, and that's where you're going to see some resolution there in the case law, I think. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I will just add, though, as I mentioned, the IRS did argue in the Michael Jackson case that the court should look to every jurisdiction where Jackson's name and image could potentially be exploited. And the court rejected that in this case where Jackson was domiciled in California, which has a specific right of publicity. I wonder if that would have been rejected if California didn't have a right of publicity, if the only places where Jackson's name and image, or that's, I mean, he's probably not a good example because he's a unique case. But if you don't have a specific right but there are other jurisdictions where you could exploit the name and image. Maybe that argument has more force. Here, they didn't really need to address it because there was law in California. So I'm wondering if that if that's dead or if the IRS may argue that um, in, in another context. And Mark, maybe I, I, you... Sorry, I go haven't ahead, fully yeah. thought through all of this, but there is some interesting... I mean, there's the full faith and credit part of this too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If the exactly. state of California gives you a property right, you should be able to enforce that property right outside the state of California. Um, but that's now, not what the statute says, right? Because like looking at the New York statute, the New York statute, you have to be well, a New York domiciliary right. to take advantage yeah, of and, it. And that's, although that tends to be more the, again, the defensive enforcement as that's opposed true. to the, I'm going to commercialize it elsewhere and people should respect my ability to do that. That's that's a hundred percent true, although it only also applies to breach within the state of most statutes, including New York, only apply to breach within the state of domicile. So you have to bring potentially all these separate actions for breaches of other statutes, the broad statutes where you don't have to be a domiciliary and the, the you know the, the the state where you happen to be to be domiciled. But Mark, I, I thought it was interesting. And I think it's, you know, the case, in, even in states that don't have these rights, most courts have found there is this right. It passes on someone's death. It can be enforced by their estate. So, Mark, I think you said that the valuation might be less or would be less if there was no specific state right. But it doesn't mean there's no value in the absence of a state right. Would you say that's correct? Well, definitely correct, uh, Sharon. And I think what's happened is, as I said in my early part of my presentation, there's a portfolio of these intellectual property rights that, the, that a celebrity has. And that portfolio, if you look at a pie chart, uh, in, on certain portfolios, the right of publicity might be the main asset. Other, and, and other celebrities, the, it might be copyrights and copyrights aren't dependent upon the, the rights in various states. So. You know, you're looking at, um, you know, you, there are plenty of celebrities in New York that have significant value, even though that right of publicity protection wasn't there. Thanks. Um, one person asked a question that was addressed to all of you, actually. Um, 
if you were to give a piece of advice that you would that you would give, having either been on this case for the last 10, 15, 10, 10 plus years, or really just soaked it up in in um, uh, since since its decision, what kind of advice would you give um, to either a living celebrity or to the family of a deceased celebrity to help them avoid some of the issues that were that were um, uh, uh, um, discussed in the Jackson State. You wanna start out, um, Gerald? I was gonna say, <clears throat> after talking about the estate tax issues, I mean, representing a, a deceased celebrity, there are many, many multiple other issues that come up with a deceased celebrity in addition to the estate taxes, maybe some even more significant. I mean, certainly, in our particular case, we have had our share of alleged spouses, children, um, including uh, somebody who claimed that she and Michael were married before they were born by Satan, um, which I had to deal with in the probate court. So um, I think I, I, I actually filed my objection to the petition said, um, California does not recognize a marriage performed by Satan. That was one of my objections. <laughs> In, in any event, um, I think from an estate tax perspective, the most important thing is your choice of appraisers. And I would say it is not a place where you should spare an expense. You should, you should you know, select the top appraisers with respect to whatever asset it is. As I said, I think that the, one of the best decisions that our team made um, was to have uh, Mark Rossler do the image name and likeness and um, we also use top appraisers for music. Um, I have given recommendations to other people. There are certain appraisers that I would recommend hands down that know the business. <clears throat> and, you know, they know that, first of all, they're credible, they're reliable. I mean, Mark, Mark when he was testifying, one of the things that um, happened, which you would read if you read the opinion, Sharon's right, it's a very entertaining opinion. Um, and Judge Holmes at one point was asking Mark on the stand, well, what about this person? What about this person? What about this person? We went through maybe, I don't know, a dozen, 20 names. And Mark said, oh, yes, I, I represented them. I represented them. I represented them. So, you know, his credibility was, was just unquestionable. Um, so that's what I would say. That is not a place to spare expense. Um, because you'll you'll end up spending more money in the long run if you don't select the right appraisers for for that task. I'll go to the living side and say, you know, to me, the, the number one thing is getting to the client and asking them, what do you want? Um, because that will lead if you get their attention to the conversation about Okay, if that's what you want, this is what you need to do to make it happen. Um, which at a minimum will get them an estate plan, you hope, and then hopefully a structure around it that will allow you to define what, how they want this right of publicity to be used. But you've got to start it with, what do you want? And then you can do the age old estate planner. Well, that's great, because none of this is gonna happen because you don't have an estate plan. <laughs> Well, I, I would chime in and just say that it's really important to be proactive. I mean, particularly in New York, which specifically declined to recognize a postmortem right of publicity. And now we specifically recognize a postmortem right of publicity. I think that, um, you know, being proactive, disaggregating, slicing and dicing to separate assets so that you could reduce the estate tax value is really key. I think in terms of just practicalities and administration, appointing that um, publicity rights advisor, as I mentioned, to deal with assets, someone who has particular expertise. I mean, I think you could see from the discussion, you really need particular expertise in order to exploit it to the maximum and in order to prevent um, a lot of um, friction among the beneficiaries. And I, I'm gonna add again that I think in the, in the marital context, this is an asset. This is an asset that could have a lot of value and it should be addressed in marital agreements. I, I guess the takeaway from my standpoint would be that um, I think that a, a number of, a few decades ago, it was, uh, it was questionable whether a celebrity even had any value after they died. 
And then as the right of publicity statute started coming into effect in the 80s and 90s, uh, there was a recognition that there was some value. And now we're um, post Jackson, we're in a situation where 5G and all the technology and the virtual reality aspect of it, there's probably in a lot of cases, significant value to uh, these personalities, uh, particularly after death. Um, we, we've talked a lot about maximizing value. Um, there, I, I'm, I'm sure you all are aware of, of the case of Robin Williams, where he almost tried to minimize value um, by um, you, uh, restricting the use of his name for a 25 year period after his death in 2014. Um, and then having uh, any, any, uh, any, um, uh, rights to go to his private foundation. I suppose this is probably directed more to Tom, although I, I welcome any comments from you, any of you on, um, on how you can use charitable planning, uh, the, the, the right of publicity and charitable planning, and can this actually reduce your estate tax um, values um, uh, significantly, if not to, to zero, depending on how, how much you, you, um, you use it. Uh, and, um, and are there problems that one might want to consider or, or issue minefield that one might consider in doing something like that? Yeah, well, uh, like any asset, uh, charitable planning is a good option to reduce value and reduce estate tax. And clients always need to understand that you're also reducing what your heirs receive. Uh, but that's a trade-off many, many, many clients are willing to make. Um, I think the thing you have to watch with this asset, uh, depending on the how it's held and the entity through which it's held, you are creating um, income that could uh, be viewed as as not related to the charitable purpose, and you may you may have some income tax issues with the charity, but those are usually things that you can conquer with a blocker entity or something. Um, it just it just takes more careful planning. You know, the, the, the fundamental question of, you know, that was the real success for Robert Williams. If he had said, go ahead and commercialize it, but leave it all to charity, he presumably also would have had no estate tax problem. I guess I'll just- oh, um, I was just gonna say, I was gonna ask, a po just pose a question. When well, that can I just add one thought yeah. before you pose a different question, yeah. Gerald, which is, I think, David, that, that question, um, is designed to ask whether there is some kind of mismatch, right? So mm -hmm. if you put a restriction as Robin Williams reportedly did, that for 25 years, you can't use anything related to his name and image. And after that, it goes to charity. When you determine the value of a gross estate, usually you do that without regard to restrictions imposed by a decedent's will but the charitable deduction is computed to take those type of restrictions into account. In other words, there might be a mismatch between the full value of the right of publicity that's included in a gross estate and somewhat less of an offsetting charitable deduction. Um, you know, as Tom said, you could give the whole right of publicity to charity. Certainly you could do that. And then you would garner a full deduction for the right of, the, of publicity. But <clears throat> given the fiduciary obligations of the charity, they might be compelled to exploit the right of publicity to garner the income that they would receive. And that's not what Robin Williams wanted. He didn't want anybody to exploit his name and image. But it's actually a question about whether there is a mismatch there and whether you could shoot yourself in the foot by having the whole value included in the estate, but something less than the value in terms of a charitable deduction. Sharon, that's exactly the issue that I was going to raise. Oh, and sorry, I, I thought you were asking no, another okay. question. Sorry. No, 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 no. That's a, you, you articulated it perfectly that um, when that case came up, we were in the midst of, of our audit. And it was one of the things that we all, you know, tax attorneys were talking about is, um, whether or not that was going to cause a problem for his estate. Now his, his estate tax return was settled. I, I'm not sure what happened or whether that was an issue, but certainly that could be an issue because you're exactly right. The charitable deduction is taken into account as of the moment of death um, without regard to the restrictions or, or the charitable 
a gift is with regard to the restriction, because the gift was you can't use the, the name and likeness, but yet what's included in the estate is the full value of the estate with the asset without taking into account the restriction the decedent imposed on it. And I'm not sure how that was ultimately resolved. Um, it's, you know, it always reminds me of the, the case of the painting, the famous painting with the bald eagle, um, because the IRS, it, yes, exactly, because the IRS Canyon, I think the painting was called Canyon, mm -hmm. the IRS does not take into account, um, for example, if you have an asset in your estate that can only be sold on the black market, that doesn't mean it's not marketable, believe it or not, you still have to value it. Um, there was a case of a guy who died with a ton of cocaine. <laughs> I don't know how they resolved that one, but, but the, the way they resolved the painting one is the family ultimately gave it to charity. That, that's how they resolved it. But I know that we have had cases where there are caught where we have cars in the estate that were brought in from Europe that can't be sold in the United States. And the IRS still insists that we have to value them as being marketable. It's a whole other issue, the problematic assets uh, in the yeah. States. Um, yeah, and can you, I, in certain circumstances, put restrictions on, you know, because yeah. certainly in certain areas you can, you can, you know, in real estate, you can create limits that run with the land that will limit its value. Well, I think we're um, pushing up against the hour and um, I want to thank all of you. Um, and on behalf of the Estate and Gift Taxation Committee, um, thank you, Sharon. Uh, thank you, Gerald. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mark, uh, for coming here virtually this evening and for giving us some insight into the Michael Jackson estate litigation and also uh, teaching us, giving us some lessons on how that estate and um, the New York um, statute uh, may assist us in providing front-end estate planning for our own clients and, and also providing advice to our clients who may, for whatever reason, have need to plan for post-mortem publicity rights. Uh, for those who are really enjoy, enjoy original source material, I will add my, my commendation to uh, read the tax court's decision, uh, and it will make tremendous reading for you. Um, and finally, to you as attendees, um, I would like to thank all of you for attending and for your ongoing support of the New York City Bar Association. The association has been a leading resource and advocate for lawyers, their clients, and the residents of the city and even the country for over 150 years. And your continued support and participation allows it to put on events like this evening's lecture and to abdicate on behalf of New Yorkers and the country at large. I thank you all and have a good evening. Thank good you. Night. Thank you. Good night.